Yeah, welcome everybody. I'm happy to see you on this. I don't know where you all are, but here it's cold and icy probably. <laughs> Is everyone in Minnesota? Raise your hand if you're from somewhere else. Oh, okay. Well, welcome. Oh, Minneapolis, okay. Um, so uh, I am a friend of Shelley's and she asked if I would be willing to sub for her. She's helping out a friend tonight. So I said, yes. So um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, so I thought maybe I'd just explain what we're gonna do and then I'll say a few words about myself. And um, I think I know most of you and um, and then we can do it. So. Shelley told me that um, that you folks uh, like a lot of, um, what did she call it, um, variety. She called it variety. So she said she sometimes she chants and she um, reads poetry and stuff, and that sounds great. So I'm going to, I'm not going to chant, but we'll have, I'm going to try to uh, play a YouTube video at the end. We'll see how that works, but um, I hope it will be of interest to you. Um, so uh, we'll start out with a maybe about 30 minutes of meditation and then if you choose to introduce yourself you could do that just say hello in your name or where you're from and then we could take a short bio break and then I'm going to say um, some things about Sila, which Shelley told me that you've been talking about I'm not sure if you've already covered some of it have you already talked about seal or is or, or is that new anybody we've been talking about ethical behavior I, I see Carol nodding her head okay so we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight um, and then uh, we're going to have some kind of guided meditations around that and if we have a chance I want to play a YouTube video at the end, which um, just kind of blows my mind. So um, that's what we're going to do. Any questions about that? And we'll go as till you know, as long as we have something to talk about. And if we end before uh, nine, then we'll end before nine, but we won't end after nine. I'll guarantee that. So um, yeah, you can read about me on the Common Ground uh, site. Um, I've been practicing since 1998, I guess, and um, in various traditions. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I like them all. <laughs> so, but tonight I'm going to stick to this tradition as best I can. And um, I, uh, I'm a mother and I'm a daughter and I'm a partner. And I guess most importantly, I'm a human being like the rest of you. And I um, feel like I need many more lives to really understand the truth of what's going on. So I'm looking forward to exploring that with you all tonight. Um, and I've taught at Common Ground for several years as well as at the University of Minnesota <clears throat> Center for Spirituality and Healing, and um, also a little group called Minneapolis Insight. So again, I'm really happy to see you all here. Um, so let's, uh, any questions about that? Anything you wanna know about me or? Okay, um, so let's start with uh, uh, meditation. I'll guide it a little bit, um, but a lot of it won't be guided. So uh, if you'd like to just find a comfortable posture, whatever that might be for you. If you feel uh, better turning your video off, if it's on, then please feel free to do that. Whatever it is that would provide the greatest ease, <clears throat> excuse me, for you. So I'll start with the bell. Mm -hmm. 
So beginning to direct your attention inward. Drawing your attention down from the busy mind. Down into the felt sense of the body. Feeling the weight of the body sitting. Feeling the contact with whatever you're sitting on. Feeling the support of the ground. The contact with the earth through your feet. Inviting the mind to rest in the felt sense of the body. Nowhere to go and nothing to do, just to sit and breathe, to experience the body. And within the stillness of the body, the relative stillness of the body, feeling the breath moving within the body. The breath coming into the body and the breath leaving the body. Not needing to tighten your attention, to focus tightly on the breath, but rather inviting a spaciousness, a spacious awareness of the felt sense of breathing. Perhaps feeling the soothing rhythm of the breath.
the breath coming into the body and leaving the body like the waves in the ocean. allowing the body to be rocked by the rhythm of the breath. So discerning for yourself tonight where you would like to rest the mind, whether it be on the felt sense of the body, or the rhythm of the breath, or perhaps a wider awareness, an awareness of momentary perceptions arising and passing away. Discerning for yourself what would be most easeful and most supportive tonight. Noticing where the mind is and if it's wandered off and gently bringing it back to this moment, to this body, to this breath.
coming back to right here and right now, available to whatever is arising. This is how it is now, being available.
So taking a moment now to bring your attention to an awareness of not only the space within the body, but the space outside the body. Mindful of the internal and the external. Sensing into the space in the room in which you're sitting, if you're sitting in a room, a space. Sensing into the space that connects all of us in this virtual Zoom room. Although we're not sharing the same physical space, we are sharing the same practice space, the same spiritual space. We're sharing it with the most important aspect of the spiritual path, spiritual friends. So seeing if you can sense into this Sangha, this community of spiritual friends. And perhaps a sense of gratitude for the fact that others showed up tonight. Others came to explore and share the Dharma. Others came to support their own and our practice. This is a hard thing to do by yourself. So gratitude for this Sangha, for this community. And gratitude for the practice. change my view I don't like looking at myself <laughs> so welcome back um, if you'd like to this would be an opportunity to just introduce yourself maybe uh, uh, I can see your name we can all see your name uh, but maybe just where you are coming in from and I'd be curious as to whether or not um, you're a regular with this group or, or if this is a first time and anything else you want to share. So uh, no, no requirement to speak, of course, but if you'd like to offer something to the rest of your spiritual friends here, um, that would be great. So I'll just let you unmute yourself if you choose to and, and we'll listen. So I, I like to write out what I'm going to say because I have an old brain and I also have a brain that wanders. So I, I could easily go off track. So um, excuse me if I'm looking down at a, and I use old technology. I printed it on a piece of paper. So uh, excuse me if I'm not looking at you. Um, so Shelly, as I said, mentioned earlier, she told me that you've been um, looking at the, the Noble Eightfold Path, and that specifically you've been talking about um, sila or ethical conduct. So when she told me that, um, I thought, oh, you know, that'll be a piece of cake, and this will be really fun because she talked about chanting and um, poetry and stuff like that. And I thought that the topic sila would... Uh, that it seemed, at least initially, it seemed kind of straightforward, not like talking about, I don't know, 
um, luminous mind or something like that that I barely understand. So, um, so I thought it was, um, you know, I, I thought it would be relatively um, unstressful. Um, but as I began to think about it, I realized that it wasn't quite as simple as I thought it was going to be. Um, because I, as I thought about it, I discovered that um, like the other path factors in the Eightfold Path, that seal our ethical behavior is connected to everything else. And for a mind like mine, which I said it tends to wander and likes to make connections with everything, it was easy to go down a rabbit hole, which I, <laughs> quick, which I quickly did. Um, so, um, yeah, and it became clear to me also, although I've heard this from many other people many times, that I could spend the rest of my life or lives exploring just one aspect of Sila. Um, so, as, as you know, Sila is right, right speech, right action, right livelihood, that I could spend a lifetime just exploring one of those. And uh, in fact, um, I could use it to understand the whole of the Dharma because it is connected to everything else. So then that, <laughs> that, that kind of blew a hole in my idea that this is going to be a piece of cake. Um, so I thought that I would, um, I would explore just one aspect of Sila, right speech, um, in the hope that um, our conversation will provide a roadmap for the others. And right, right speech seemed particularly um, important to talk about because of the amount of wrong speech that's out there right now and the magnitude of the suffering that that has caused and is causing. So um, the framework that I'd like to use to explore right speech is one that um, several of you are familiar with. Um, Amy, in particular, was um, in a in a group that just ended where we were we were using Philip Moffat's book Dancing with Life to uh, explore the the Four Noble Truths, and his that book is based on some teachings that he re received from Ajahn Sumedho, um, which talks about um, the Buddha's teaching on what, what are called the 12 insights. So in this teaching, the Buddha describes three stages in the understanding of each of the Four Noble Truths. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, and then we're going to do some meditation, some guided meditations and reflection on, on this. So um, the Buddha said in Ajahn Sumedha talks about um, the first stage of, in understanding any of the Four Noble Truths or the path factors in the, in the Eightfold Path is to understand it intellectually. So by that he meant to, to reflect for yourself on the truth of the teaching and to see if it rings true to you which is what I love about Buddhism, right? I mean, the Buddha said over and over again, find out for yourself. Don't take it from, don't take my word. Explore for yourself. Ehi pasiko, come and see. So for example, one might reflect, is it true that there is such a thing as right or wise speech? And what would that look like? What would its characteristics be? So, you know, reflecting on on, on the truth of that particular teaching in, in an intellectual or cognitive way. So the second stage in understanding uh, the Four Noble Truths is to directly experience it in the body and the heart. And I love that too, because it's so easy to get caught in our heads when we're thinking about this stuff. And so the, the instruction is to actually feel it in the body. So in other words, what does hearing or expressing right speech or wise speech feel like in the body? When somebody says something to you that is wise, what do you experience? And what do you experience in the heart? 
And likewise, what does it feel like when somebody speaks to you in an unwise way? When somebody says something that is harmful to you, how does that feel? So that's the second way of knowing it. So uh, I'm looking for the third. What did I do with that piece of paper? Interesting. Um, huh. Oh, I don't see it. So I'll, I'll just extemporize here. So the the third the third stage in knowing or understanding uh, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path is to know that you're knowing. So to recognize, to be aware of the fact that you know this to be true. And you know that by how it affects how you live your life. Does the fact that you understand what wise speech is, what right speech is, how does that affect how you interact with others in your life? That is kind of the proof of the pudding. It's the knowing that you know the truth of that, of that um, particular teaching. So I thought we would, so we, we'll look at right speech from this framework. So I thought we could start with the first stage of understanding, which is again, is using your intellect to reflect on what is being said in that teaching and then seeing if it rings true to you. So, so let's for, I'll first talk about what the Buddha said about right speech. So from the Samutta Nikaya, he said, and what is right speech? Abstaining from lying, from divisive speech, from abusive speech, and from idle chatter. This is called right speech. And from the Anutta Nikaya, he said, monks, a statement endowed with five factors is well-spoken, not ill-spoken. It is blameless and unfaulted by knowledgeable people. What five? It is spoken at the right time. It is spoken in truth. It is spoken affectionately. It is spoken beneficially and it is spoken with a mind of goodwill. So when I when I read that, uh, it, that seemed pretty clear to me, it seemed, and it seemed pretty comprehensive. Right or skillful or wise speech is truthful, it's kind, it promotes connection rather than divisiveness, and it is useful rather than being idle gossip or chatter. Furthermore, it's spoken at the right time with a mind that is imbued with goodwill when it can be most beneficial to the hearer. So that to me seemed like a pretty good description of what I would call wise speech. So that, that's kind of the intellectual approach of understanding uh, one of these teachings. So I'm curious about you know, how it sits with you would you agree that right or skillful speech is speech that abstains from lying, from divisiveness, from abuse, from idle chap chatter, and that it needs to be spoken at the right time with a heart of goodwill and the motivation to be of benefit? So if you were to describe what you thought was a wise speech, is that how you would describe it? Is there anything that's not included that should be? or something that's included that should be excluded? In other words, for you, does that seem like a, uh, you know, does that seem like a good description of wise speech? So I'll just open it up, Any, anybody. Does that make sense to you intellectually? Or are there things that you think ought to be added? I think, you know, for me, there, that's pretty comprehensive. You know, the, the issue is, generally speaking, knowing when those things are all in place, <laughs> you know, because I think there's a lot of delusion that sort of will say, yes, this is this way or this way or whatever. And I think also the discernment around 
if you know, I think Mark has mentioned this too in his teaching. Like, am I the right person to, to deliver this news, even if it's correct, even if it's wise in that, in that way? Am I the one that should tell this to this person or or not? Like your partner sometimes is too, a heated, you know, it's too hot of an issue or something, you know? So, so yeah. yeah. So so that might be something you add to that list. Am I the right person to be delivering this? Yeah. Interesting. Great. Yeah. And that discernment about, oh, are all these things here? It requires quite a bit of mindfulness, doesn't it, to be present enough to do that? Yeah. Anybody else? Anything you would add or subtract? This is uh, Mary. Yeah. So I definitely that you know where and oftentimes I've heard the kind of list of things and it ends with you know uh, goodwill or or you know with a mind of of goodwill and to me that's like cements everything else because I of course if that's there then those other things you know will likely be there I have to say the only thing that always kind of jars me when I hear it is um, the thing about idle chatter you know I, I have a hard time really um, you know really latching on to that it's like well, yeah, sometimes, you know, making a person feel comfortable and, you know, um, you know, not coming on too, too heavy when you first uh, are getting to know somebody is, uh, you know, a wise thing. But, you know, so I don't, I certainly see about not wasting, you know, someone's time or uh, just going on and on to make yourself the focus of attention. But yeah, that always just kind of jumps out at me, that's all. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I, I, yeah, I just heard Gil Fronstall talking about that very thing, about the, the idle chatter business. And he talked about that his understanding was, he's, He's talking more about just gossiping about other people or talking about people that aren't present when they're, uh, and he talked about the, the role, the, the, the wise role of idle chatter. I mean, of, break, of the very thing you talked about, of kind of breaking the ice or making people feel at ease. And, you know, in Minnesota, we talk about the weather. That's a way, you know, to kind of begin to develop a relationship. So, um, it was his feeling that that idle chatter did not encompass that kind of speech, which might be a, a relationship builder. Yeah, thanks for, for bringing that up. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I just remembered what it is that I lost in the page I can't find. So I thought I would read it um, before we go to the second stage in understanding. And it does come from Philip Moffat's book, Dancing with Life. So it's just his, it's his description of these three stages. Um, there are three, what he calls insights, I'm calling them stages associated with each noble truth, and they follow a similar pattern. First reflecting, then directly experiencing, and finally knowing. The Buddha taught that in order to completely understand a noble truth, you first reflect on it as a, as a conceptual description of a general truth in life. When you intellectually know that a given noble truth is at least logical and theoretically possible, then the Buddha directs you to the second insight of each truth. This insight requires you to consciously seek to realize the truth. You immerse yourself in the truth and therefore experience its validity for you, for you personally. Practicing the second insight for each, each truth means seeking direct experience of it in your own life through mindful, compassionate awareness. The second insight of each truth is not theoretically you are to experience it in your body to know both the wow and the ouch of it. This direct experience is what makes the Buddha's teaching a living wisdom rather than a philosophy or ontology. Finally, having carefully 
thought about the noble truth and known the embodied experience of it, you are ready for the third insight, knowing. Ajahn Sumedha refers to this insight as the call to know that you know. It involves mindfully in, in, in integrating what you've just learned and felt in your daily life. Okay, so that's his description of these three stages and understanding these teachings. So we've talked about the first one, and that's intellectually knowing the teaching and seeing if it fits for you. So I thought we could move on then to the second stage of understanding, which is this directly experiencing the truth of the teaching in the body and in the what I'm adding in the heart. So what do you feel when you experience the presence or absence of right speech? Does right speech lead to an experience of suffering or non-suffering? So I thought um, I thought we could take a moment to actually reflect in a guided meditation on this, the felt experience of wise speech. So uh, if you're game, I would just invite you to find a comfortable posture again for your body. And if you want to turn off your camera, you can turn it off or leave it on. So let's take a moment then to settle into the body. Feel the weight of the body sitting and the contact with whatever you're sitting on. And feeling also the contact of your feet with the floor. Feeling the support of the ground under your feet. And the weight of your body in the chair. And from this place of groundedness, turning your attention now to a memory of when someone communicated with you using right speech or wise speech. Remembering when someone said or wrote something perhaps that was both kind and truthful. Something that perhaps led to a deeper connection between the two of you or to a deeper understanding of life. So taking a moment to recall this memory. Could have been a letter or a text, an email, spoken communication. Recalling as best you're able the words that were communicated and their effect on you. What did you then and what do you notice now in your body as you recall this and in your heart? This moment of wise, of kind, truthful, of beneficial speech. Bring awareness to the felt sense in the body of wise speech. Perhaps a feeling of a release or calm or warmth. Noticing whatever you are experiencing and savoring it. And now bringing to mind the memory of when you experienced unwise speech, when someone said something to you that was unkind or untrue or both, or even a time when someone said something that was true but was communicated at the wrong time, 
time when you couldn't benefit from it for whatever reason. So calling to mind a time when you received unwise speech and noticing what you feel in your body and in your heart. Perhaps a feeling of tightness or cold or even numbness. Bringing your attention to your body as you recall your experience of unwise speech. And now letting the memories go and returning to this moment and this breath. Feeling the breath coming into the body and the breath leaving the body. anybody would like to share about that were you able to feel the effect of wise or unwise speech in the body as you recalled this that's a way of knowing anybody yeah would you like to share what you experienced if that's okay Um, for me, I, I think there was a sense of um, I, I, what comes to my mind is, is like somebody's got my back, you know, when, when the wise speech, like there was some sense of like being held a little bit, like, you know, almost from like behind and, and then the unwise speech, there was, it was almost like a hardness or like a, almost like I, I developed some sort of like a shell or something like that, where I was trying to block it, where the heart was hurt maybe, and it just felt very, like almost like a stone in front of me here. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Carol. I had an experience about four weeks ago at a uh, brunch where there was a lot of unkindness coming at me. And then I went to Common Ground because Alice Balmer, who is a longtime member, had a book, had written a book and was reading. And there was maybe 30 people in the room and the love and the wise speech and the wise actions were, it was just, it was like a total different thing. And I said, this is my group. <laughs> mm. So you could feel that. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. So that's the second way of knowing the truth of the teachings. It's an embodied knowing. So now we'll go to the, the third stage or the third way of knowing, knowing that you know, that's Sumedho's words. How have you integrated your understanding of right speech, wise speech as part of the path to freedom from suffering in your own life? How has the way you live your life changed as a result of this understanding? So has your understanding of what it means to engage in wiser right speech changed how you communicate with others? Are you less likely, for instance, to speak impulsively or to, quote, speak your truth, unquote, without regard to its effect on others? That's, I think, a popular thing to do these days. 
Have you withheld telling someone the truth because it wasn't the right time or wasn't kind or as Jessica suggested, you weren't the right person to be delivering the message? So have you noticed ways in which your understanding of this teaching of wise speech has influenced how you how you live your life and how you are in relationship with others. I'm wondering if anybody has an experience with that. One thing that comes to my mind is, I think I've lost some of my romance with telling the truth. You know, there, I now have a different frame in which to think about that because it can be very unkind and very harsh and harmful to always tell the truth. But that's certainly a message I think I got somewhere along the line of the importance of that without the rest of it. So that's something that I've seen as a important change in my own life. I don't always achieve it, but um, at least I have some awareness of it. So anybody else noticed ways in which this teaching of wise speech has change things for them? I was just going to say there's a, um, I notice the impact of when I say something unwise. I mean, I, I feel that quickly. I, I, I have a lot more compassion when I hear unwise speech from others. And, and I think that there's a, uh, just that sort of, uh, I think there's lots of times I've refrained from, you know, sort of just saying something where, where I'm kind of seeing that it's a view or having a better perspective of where the motive might be, where that the motive comes into question. I have to see that that's the motive is probably problematic or, or, or view oriented. So I, I can, I can easily, more easily withhold it, hmm. even if it's true. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? One thing I say to myself is, do I need to say this? Because I'm all about the truth. And sometimes it really hits a rock on that person. So do I need to say this? Mm -hmm. Thank you. What else? Of course. Uh... In, in, in our partnerships, we can get a lot of practice. And uh, one of the things that I've, I found really helpful for me is, uh, not that I'm perfect or anything, I'm far from that, but uh, when, it, when, when you feel like you're, okay, you got, I, I just got stung, to not so much be reactive, but to say to my partner, can you pay a little bit more attention to your timing? And, and then I go, oh, I need to pay attention to my timing too. Mm -hmm. It's all about timing. Or sometimes it's, for me, all about just not saying anything. Just being present. Right. Sometimes silence is the wisest is the wisest thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ryan. Yeah, I, um, wise speech has been really big in my life, actually. And for a while, it was especially something on my mind. And I feel like paying attention to that, although it was pretty difficult to like look back at some of the, the ways I would say stuff or the way I was saying stuff, that was uh, pretty difficult. But I definitely like felt better, you know, as a person in the way that I've walked around in the world. Um, it has caused some issues too, in the sense that um, I have some old friends that, and I knew this always bothered me and I'm not saying I'm a better person than them by any means, but there's a lot of type of joking and things that are said that are very, uh, I mean, unsavory. <laughs> Uh, so, so it, it really bothers me because I think they're like, I, I know where they're coming from. It's kind of like, um, in their mind joking and stuff, but I think it's like really hurtful things 
to even like voice out loud in the world. Um, so I found myself kind of distancing myself from them and that's been kind of difficult. Um, but you know, there's other things too, but you know, <laughs> so that's a case where maybe right speech, it was, it was something that needed to happen, but it's, um, although it's been good for my life caused some kind of, um, internal drama, trying to figure out how to, you know, deal with those relationships. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? So this is Mary. I'll just say, Ryan, thank you for uh, saying that because um, uh, not too long ago, um, I forget what the setting was, but uh, my granddaughter said we were there's a bunch of people around and we were all talking and I heard my granddaughter say, yeah, well, watch out for grandma because she thinks she's so woke. She <laughs> And I oh. thought, oh, my goodness, you know, like because there have been occasions where I thought she was, um, you know, not being kind and thoughtful about what she was saying. And, um, but what I've noticed is, in, and, and I couldn't talk, I couldn't, you know, say anything because I was, uh, I was concerned that I would just jump on her, you know, and, uh, prove how woke I was, but, um, but what I realized is that it's still there and that there's more conversation to be had, you know, and I haven't done that, but that's part of right speech is that when there's something that, you know, is unsaid that may need to be said, you know, you got to you got to face up to it, I think. So anyway, I just really appreciate you raising that uh, point, Ryan, because I think there is something there for me to take on. Thanks, Mary. Maybe that gets back to Hamsa's comment about timing and can the people person receive it and all of those things. Yeah. So I, I have to just add one yeah. more thing. Yeah. yeah. When it, it makes me think of a couple of times when, uh, you know, when you're dealing with somebody, you know, these poor people that are work online, whether it's, you know, getting doctor appointments or you get the wrong thing through Amazon or whatever. And I find myself going, oh, my God, Hamsa, you're so crappy. Cut it out. And I've even sometimes called people back and said, geez, I am so sorry. I was so crabby, you know. Um, it just bounces right back at me. Um, but anyway, yeah, just that's caused me to pause and take a look and, and go, be a little kinder here. Do you want their job? No, be, be kinder to them. So anyway. Thank you. Well, so thank you for playing along with me and for uh, exploring this. I think it's, it's, it's a useful framework to me anyways, to think about it understanding it in these different ways, intellectually as an embodied experience, and then as the lived experience in your life and how it's integrated. So I wanted to end and read something um, uh, which to me speaks to um, there being different kinds of truths. Um, and you may have heard this, it's, it was, it was read a lot in years past. I haven't heard it recently, but um, this is from a, a man named Richard Seltzer, who's a surgeon. And the title of the book was Mortal Lessons, Notes on the Art of Surgery. I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. She will be thus from now on. The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from the private. Who are they, I ask myself. 
he and this wry mouth I've, I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, greedily. The woman speaks, will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once I know who he is. I understand that I, and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with a god. He bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I am so close I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers, to show her that their kiss still works. So I wanted to um, end with this YouTube video, but I think we don't have time. Plus, it is so powerful that I, I don't want to just play it and then leave it there. But for me, it is um, incredibly powerful. It is an incredible example of how powerful speech is. And in this, in this particular speech, I think it is very, very wise, even though you could la look at it and say that it, there's an aspect of it that's also divisive. I don't actually agree with that. So having said all that, I'll tell you what it is, and I strongly suggest you look at it if you haven't seen it. It, it was viral a couple of weeks ago. And, and and discern for yourself whether or not you think this is right speech. So this is the black pastor, Jamal Bryant, from uh, New Life Church outside of Atlanta. And it's a part of a, I think it was a sermon that he gave uh, entitled, I Don't Need a Walker. Has anybody seen that? Oh my God. Okay, we, <laughs> you, you've got to watch this. So just Google, I Don't Need a Walker. And you will, you will get the, it's a short YouTube video. It's his sermon about why one should not vote for Herschel Walker. And it is, um, regardless of what your politics are, it is amazing. And I think it illustrates also the power of the visual. So being able to see him and then hear his words uh, makes me want to join his church. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So. I wish we had time to look at it because I'd be really interested in, in your reaction to it and whether or not you think it's wise speech. But um, if you want, you can always email me and let me know what, what you think. Um, it's genehaley at gmail.com. So again, it's uh, I don't need a walker. Um, yeah, so before we end, is there is there anything else that anyone would like to and so this is Mary. I just yeah. want to add thank you, thank you, thank you, Jean, so much. This has been lovely. I mean, just um, I really feel uh, um, it's I just so appreciate uh, the way teachers of the Dharma can add something just slightly different, a slightly different perspective, and it just opens up. And I really feel that this evening with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I just want to remind everybody, I did put uh, in the chat, um, reminding people that everything from Common Ground is offered in the spirit of Donna, no charge for anything. Um, if you would like to, um, you know, our, our guest teachers um, in particular, are you willing to do this? Uh, but if you do make uh, Donna for this program, be sure to put in Jean's uh, Jean Haley at the on the Common Ground website and take a look at the link if you need it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? So so let's dedicate the goodness, the merit of our being here tonight together, and of our exploring the Dharma, of exploring wise or right or skillful speech, whatever you want to call it just reflecting on the fact that we do this not only for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all beings, all beings everywhere, being seen and unseen, human beings, animal beings, insect beings, fish beings, 
all the beings of the world. May all beings everywhere be free from suffering. May all beings everywhere know peace. So thanks again for coming, and this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Bye.